Hi, I'm Alan. Welcome to Panafish. This is my second video in my series on basement finishing. I'm not a professional, so I'm just providing my personal perspective on basement finishing. And I'll show you the tools and the techniques I chose and why I chose them. But be warned, I don't know of any professional that would finish a basement like this. Because my home is a ranch, it came with a large basement. So I had plenty of area to set up a shop for my woodworking equipment. The other side of the basement is the area that will be finished for my wife's hobby area and as a possible guest room. This is the basic layout for that new room. It will include three doors and one window. So now that you've seen a virtual tour, let's go into the basement and see the real thing. The first step was to clear the area and put a rough layout on the floor using blue painter's tape. All of this reorganizing has left my shop a bit messy, but it sure is nice to have, especially with a large project like this. This is the wall where I installed the window in the previous video. And on this side of the basement were two problems that I initially wasn't sure how to handle. The sump in the corner and the electrical panel on this wall. Eventually, I decided the best way to deal with them was to make that side of the room a long storage closet. The other obstacles to deal with were the lally column in the middle of the room and the cracked uneven concrete floor, but more on that later. Initially, I made a rough estimate of how many 2x4s I'd need, and I went to several big box stores looking for some nice straight boards. Some sellers refer to their top quality lumber as prime or premium. As I see it, there are four main defects you want to avoid when buying your 2x4s. The first defect is crown, which is a curve or bend in the stud when viewing it down its edge. Boards with significant crowns should be avoided at all costs. The second defect is twist, which is kind of self-explanatory, and I generally don't buy these boards either. The third defect is bow, which is a curve when looking down the side. This defect is the least problematic and will cause the fewest problems during construction, unless of course the bowing is severe. The fourth defect to avoid are knots. A few knots isn't a problem, but many of them, or really large ones, make the board less desirable. No matter how carefully you pick the pile at your local Home Depot, some boards will just be straighter than others. You'll want to save those straightest boards for your doorways and corners. And when you're done picking your lumber, don't leave the pile like this. Unfortunately, when you buy lumber, it may feel dry but it probably still has excess moisture. So that perfectly straight two by four can still curve as it dries. Wood is simply unpredictable, but you can still minimize the wood's movement with a simple technique called stickering. Using uniform strips of wood, you stack the two by fours allowing for even airflow to all sides of each board. This combined with the even pressure of the stack will minimize warping as the boards dry. Before I could begin building the walls, I had to lay out their location by snapping chalk lines on the floor. To demonstrate how I laid out my lines, imagine this workbench surface is the floor, and the room is going to be a simple rectangular room. The most important factor is that the corners must be square. Failing to build walls with square corners will only lead to headaches and extra work later, especially when you install the drywall and the flooring. While there are lots of carpentry squares available to check for 90 degrees, when building stud walls, they are just too small to ensure 90 degree corners. Traditionally, professionals use the 3-4-5 rule. It's just a convenient shortcut for the Pythagorean theorem. It works, and it's cheap, but I won't be using this method to make my wall square. First, I chose my longest wall and snapped a straight line on the floor to represent the inside edge of that wall. 
Then I used some blue tape and a marker to mark the beginning and the ending of the wall. I chose a laser for laying out my square corners. The Bosch GPL5 was the most cost-effective option at the time I bought it. But recently, there's been a flood of cheap 360-degree lasers on Amazon. I recommend you get one of these. The Bosch laser I chose projects five laser points, each at 90 degrees to one another. One laser shoots down, another vertically, and the other three shoot horizontally. So all I had to do was place the laser over one of my corner points, and using blocks of wood, I could locate the opposite corner and mark it, then snap a line for that wall and repeat all corners until done. The newer 360 degree lasers project lines, so you won't need blocks of wood for that type of laser. And lastly, I used the laser to help me project the same lines that are on the floor onto my ceiling. That way I have uh, locations for the top and the bottom of my walls. Many YouTube videos and professionals recommend building each stud wall flat on the floor and then standing it into position. But once again, I chose the hard way. Because of my uneven concrete floor, I chose to install the base plate and the top plate first and then cut each stud to fit. Before I could install the top plate to my walls, I had to install blocking between the ceiling joists at the corners so I'd have some surface to attach my walls to. Here you can see the chalk line that I had snapped across the ceiling joist so I could position each top plate. To hold the top and bottom 2x4s in place while screwing, I used a couple of quick support rods. They turned a two-man job into a one-man job and provided excellent clamping pressure to hold everything in place. To install the base plate 2x4 to the concrete, I used blue Tapcon screws. I countersunk the screw heads. This avoids any problems with the positioning of the studs. You'll need a good hammer drill and a concrete drill bit. It goes without saying that you'll need a good tape measure, but measuring long distances like floor to ceiling for each stud is a real pain for one person. I bought the Bosch GLM-50 laser tape measure, and at first I was skeptical if it would be accurate enough. But eventually, I came to rely on it for its speed and accuracy to within 1 32nd of an inch. A good miter saw is a must for cutting 2x4s. Although not as fast as nails, I chose screws and pocket holes to assemble my studs. The Craig HD pocket hole jig was designed specifically for assembling 2x4s. Standard 2x4 construction is 16 inches on center. That means your 2x4s should be spaced 16 inches apart. And since drywall sheets are usually installed horizontally, you'll also need to ensure that the ends of each 8-foot sheet will land on a stud. You'll also need to build mini walls or soffits around low hanging ductwork or beams. It's not complicated, but make sure you keep everything square and plumb. Installing lighting and electrical is easy if you know what you're doing, but can be a problem if you don't. So I recommend you hire a professional. And if you do decide to do it yourself, be sure you do your research and check your local codes. Little did I know at the time, installing the studs would be the easiest part of my construction project.